Uh, thank you very much, Ben and Leslie, especially for setting the table for, for my talk. And uh, as president of the Board of Progressives for Immigration Reform, I'd like to thank you all for, for coming here today. It's great to see uh, friends and uh, hopefully new friends uh, out there today. Um, so what can we do about the situation that Leslie has, has so aptly described? Yeah. I don't, don't need that. I, I, I teach at Colorado State University, and I tell my students, you know, it is possible to give a talk without PowerPoint. Um, hopefully I'll prove that to you all today. No, so someday you can teach me how to do that, Phil. <laughs> well, you do it very well. But, but, um, so, so anyway, uh, Leslie has, has laid out the, the situation in the law very aptly. Uh, what, what could be done about this? One thing we've discussed is a petition to the Council on Environmental Quality to um, revisit their rule and change it to specifically state that population growth uh, should be uh, in itself a trigger for creating, uh, for, for uh, necessitating an environmental impact statement. Uh, that makes sense to us. Uh, another thing they could clarify is the need for, uh, within environmental impact statements as a whole, to bring in systematically population impacts. Uh, I'm f the last EIS I commented on, for instance, was a dam project uh, on the Cash Laputa River in Colorado. And um, in terms of the law, in terms of the point of putting something into the record to appeal the decision, and in terms of um, appealing to the general public, we commenting on this dam project didn't wade into population because um, there isn't the... Well, you can comment that, for instance, if we go forward with the dam project, that is going to increase population in an area by 50,000 people. But you can put that in the record, but it, it doesn't matter in terms of appealing the decision. So that's, that's a problem. And I think there's real possibility to make that petition, and uh, especially if we, if we could get some of the major environmental groups behind such a petition. That would, that would help, I think. But uh, that's a long-term project, and in the meantime, Progressives for Immigration Reform is going to move on this situation ourselves. Uh, starting this year and over the next uh, year and a half to two years, one of our main projects is to develop our own environmental impact statement on U.S. immigration policy. So uh, we're going forward with that. I mean, NEPA, as Leslie very aptly described, uh, it doesn't mandate any level of environmental protection. What it is, um, and one of the strengths of it is, it's a law to get us as a nation, both the decision makers in any particular case and the general public, to think about what we're doing, to take a look at our big discrete actions, but also um, through so-called programmatic environmental impact statements to look at the path that certain government policies, at least, the environmental path that they're taking us on. So uh, we're going to do our own programmatic environmental impact statement on U.S. immigration policy. And um, Leslie, when you had your, your Bible, your NEPA Bible there, and you, you put it down, it made this thud, thud, you know, there's a lot there. And when, when that happened, I was thinking, okay, if we had... Every environmental impact statement that was finalized in this country last year, you know, how, how tall would that be as a sheet of a stack of papers? It would probably go through the ceiling. I don't know. It might go through the roof. I tried to find numbers on how many EISs were completed last year. Uh, I think it would run into the hundreds, at least. But I can't really think of a single one uh, that I've heard about that will deal with larger environmental impacts than uh, the action last year to let in a million more people into the United States. Huge environmental impacts. And when you accumulate that, um, the impacts get even huger. So that's what we're going to try to do with this project. We're going to uh, take the, the EIS format, which people understand and uh, appreciate, and try to quantify these impacts of... Uh, of our immigration policies. So uh, we believe an EIS on U.S. immigration policy can be a very powerful educational and advocacy tool. 
Uh, in Australia, the, in March of 2010, the Australian Conservation Foundation, which is the largest environmental group in Australia, petitioned the Australian government to have human population growth designated as, quote, a key th threatening process, unquote, under their uh, Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. And uh, we have Kelvin Thompson on the panel today, MP from Australia. Uh, I've talked to him about this, this action. Um, the petition was denied, I believe, uh, eventually by the government, but it was a, a very good means to get the issue out in front of the general public. So um, we're going to follow sort of the main EIS process. We're going to have a scoping process whereby we, we put out uh, a notice of our intention to do this environmental impact statement, uh, especially to environmentalists. Uh, we hope uh, we get your emails here and, and we'll send you out that notice and hopefully you can help tell us what you think we should look at when we do the EIS. Um, so it's a, a nice way to sort of generate publicity and get, um, get people bought into the, uh, the project. Once we, we've done that, we're going to start working on our demographic projections. Obviously, there's a lot of good work out there, and there are demographers who are willing to, to help with this. Um, one of the things that the, the EIS, um, well, NEPA, as it's developed over the decades, has, has worked hard to do is to not just um, discreetly focus on relatively uh, uh, small actions and, and leave it at that as if these actions are just kind of coming out of nowhere and, and happening. So in the 90s, for instance, we started to get programmatic environmental impact statements looking at um, not just a particular fisheries decision in Alaska, but, you know, fishery policies in Alaska. Where is that going to take us over the next 10 to 50 years? And that was very much a, a step forward. Um, for this EIS, we're going to try to look not just 50 years out, but even 100 and 200 years out. Because after all, uh, population is one of those uh, uh, issues that, that accumulates. Hopefully we've all seen Al Bartlett's talk on, on this and uh, some of the other uh, talks out there. Roy Beck's talk with, with the marbles. Um, so if we can broaden people's focus to, to think about what our immigration policies today or over the next 10 years are going to mean decades and decades down the line, uh, you know, not, not only is that going to maybe help our side in terms of arguing for reducing immigration, but I, honestly, isn't that part of uh, helping Americans to think about where we're going environmentally? I mean, it, it seems like it's, it's necessary to do that kind of thing. So we're going to try to get those projections. Um, as part of the EIS process, you have to lay out reasonable options. Uh, so we'll lay out options uh, regarding what our immigration uh, numbers, annual numbers, should be. And then based on those options, we're going to try to quantify environmental impacts, uh, focusing on five main areas. Uh, water use and uh, water withdrawals from natural systems. Uh, sprawl and loss of farmland and wildlife habitat. Um, uh, overall impacts on biodiversity, um, greenhouse gas emissions, which we're, we're all talking about and which most people don't realize that uh, the overwhelming majority, something like four-fifths of our greenhouse gas emission increases in the U.S. over the past 20 years um, come from population growth, not from growth in per capita energy use. So we're going to look at, at that. And finally, and a little bit more difficultly, we're going to try to look at the international environmental impacts of U.S. immigration policy. So we're, we're often told, well, look, uh, population issues are global issues. They're not national issues. Um, so focus on what's really important. Um, one of the good things about NEPA and the EIS process is it takes all us good globalist environmentalists and forces us to point our nose toward where we're living and the impacts of our decisions on, on where we are, where we live. So to some degree, I, I think the argument that population growth is a global issue instead of a national one is, is incorrect, right? It's both. Um, but on the other hand, there's some truth to the idea that we have to think globally. So hopefully in this process, we can, um, we can do that. So let's ask questions like, um, 
if you take a couple tens of millions of people over the next decade and you change them from living in the developing world to being American citizens, what are the impacts of that on total world carbon emissions? Those are the kind of questions we, we want to ask. And there are more difficult questions, like if you um, allow immigration uh, from Guatemala or Mexico or some of these countries, uh, mass immigration, large numbers, what's the impact on Mexican policy or Guatemalan policy regarding um, abortion rights, regarding uh, these countries taking their, their uh, demographic problems more seriously or less seriously. So in any case, our goal is to um, possibly, as Leslie says, develop the, the, um, the documentation for going to the CEQ and asking them to think about this issue again. Uh, potentially, uh, once we've done our EIS, petitioning the federal government to do their own official EIS on U.S. immigration policy. That would be a, a wonderful uh, thing. But our goal is also to sort of open up a conversation about this um, with you, with environmentalists around the country. Um, our plan is to develop this on a dedicated website and to, as we complete parts of the project, to, to put it out there in, in front of the general public, get comments back on it. Uh, so we think it could be a wonderful educational tool and an outreach tool to the environmental community. So we're excited about this. We, we thank... Uh, we thank our supporters, the Whedon Foundation, uh, John Roy, and the, the Qualcomm Foundation, uh, instrumental in this. Uh, if any of you want to volunteer to crunch some numbers, you can talk with me afterwards. Uh, we'd, we'd love that kind of help as well. Uh, and of course, if you want to make a contribution to PFER, we're, we're open to that as well. We're open to that, aren't we, Leah? Amen. We're, we're open to that. Okay, so... Um, <laughs> Thank you very much. There, there's a lot more I could say about this. We're very excited about this project, but uh, maybe l let's give some time for your questions. Instead of waiting for uh, the government to do this sometime, you get it out there. We, it gives all of us uh, tools to work with. I'm really pleased with that. And my experience has been that among many of our environmentalist friends, uh, it feels selfish to do anything to protect the U.S. environmental resources. I mean, it's, it's amazing. These, these groups exist supposedly, primarily, uh, to protect the environmental resources in this country. But if you start to talk about it in conjunction with the rest of the world, that would be wrong. But not locally. I mean, uh, you can almost never find an environmentalist who says, we should destroy this jewel in my area uh, it, because there's some other place in the world that needs help more. And, you know, it's like you, you can get people to want to protect the Chesapeake Bay when they don't want to protect the American environment as a whole uh, on the immigration thing. So that's, I guess that's just the key thing is I think don't just, uh, I would suggest don't just talk about the national impacts, but, but, uh, but talk about specifically what will happen with things that people do know and love. I, I really love that suggestion. Uh, we're going to have to think uh, hard about how to do that in this context. Uh, maybe there's a way to talk about the general economic impacts that uh, individuals might find in their communities. You know, if we increase the U.S. population by a certain amount, can you talk about what that might mean in Colorado or California? Can you talk about what it might mean in the L.A. basin? We're a little schizophrenic on this in the environmental movement. We, we talk about thinking globally, but, you know, what grabbed you to, a lot of you, to make you environmentalists? Chances are it was some place that you loved that you were concerned about. And that's where the new people are coming into environmentalism. So we can't we started to sort of step on that and, and almost, you know, tell these people, well, you know, you've got to take a broader view of this. And, and um, yes and no, you don't want to lose the love of the place that you care the most about because then it all sort of becomes unimportant to you.